Uh, let me pour some uh, coconut water from Vietnam. I got some other, I got, got some a couple of new ones. This is the uh, one I got from Aldi's, but uh, there's this other one I just got. Down here, we all cocoa organic. This is also, I think, Vietnam sauce. I like the Vietnam, yeah, made in Vietnam. I like the Vietnam ones, so I just finished that one, so I'll use this mix. I'll compare the taste. Oh, I'm doing this a bit of. Oh. Might as well take my blood pressure pill, which I vow to get off of. Sooner or later. The sooner, the better. So look here, I'm in St. Louis. And, um, well, it's a long story, but this thing. And look, because where he is, my, it's my best friend's house. Anyway, she, he has um, a lot of my writings. And then I just noticed this is a uh, the, uh, the, the 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 director's book, my book, from uh, the outside of the play that we did that, um, at the outside. Of, it was about the same time. What when, when is this year? Because my glasses. That uh, we had we had advertisement in the newspaper like Amsterdam News and stuff like that. It was uh, January 26, 1991. So 1991, the end of January 1991, we put this on. Um, and see, see was. We had these advertisements. We made we made all kinds of advertisement. This one said, um, "Life, hell, death, rebirth, hell." You know what I mean? It's like, uh, it's, we, we, uh oh yeah, we the play was done Monday, January twenty eighth. Um, it's supposed to be scheduled from eight thirty uh, in the evening to three thirty. Man, we went to like <laughs> six, not six, like like five thirty or something like that. It was like nine hours and or whatever it was. How, Oh, that is right there, over WBAI right there. Da 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 da. It was two parts, uh, dread and uh, the outsider. But interestingly enough, remember this is the advertiser that appeared in in the Amsterdam news, and they advertising this play, the Langston Hughes play. Uh, well, this play was by Langston Hughes and, jo and, and Zora Neale Hurston called Mudbone, and it was uh, oh music by Taj Mahal, uh, and uh, prologue and epilogue by George Houston Bass. I don't know what it is. But it's directed by Michael Schultz. I went and saw this. Now you said, so what? Big deal. No, you don't understand. Michael Schultz was my first acting teacher at Negro Ensemble Company. When I, when I was 17 years old, I went to Negro Ensemble Company. In fact, Michael Schultz did the first play at the Negro Ensemble Company, official one. Um, um, uh, uh, Song of the Lusitanian Bogey, which was the Mac. To this day, it's the most magnificent play ever, ever. And, and it, it, it's just. Song Loose Temple, Moses Gunn, all those people, Graham, you know, Rosalind Cash, all them, all the people, you know, the Negro Ensemble Company. <laughs> all of them were there, you know what I mean? They all saw my point. Never mind. So anyway, so this is kind of uh, fortuitous. And, and then, in, that, in fact, that class with Michael Schultz, um, we, we, we had to give, um, uh, the class had to make our own play. And they, and the, uh, uh, Kashasha, uh, uh, she made a she wrote a play for our class called the last dragon um and they, she wrote it for me i was the last dragon <laughs> it's a lot, just the title i wasn't star to play i was a dragon you know the dragon gets it's like colonialism and the dragon gets you know whatever my demise you know i think you know, does, did she have it that the no the dragon got captured i don't know if he got killed i forgot I, whatever it is right but li interestingly enough michael schultz is also known for a movie they did called the last dragon you know what I mean? But it has nothing to do with the, the thing like that. I don't, it's a long story. Anyway, so so I found this and I'm going through it. Now here's the interesting thing. Talk about beginnings. Um, this see this uh, note was sent to me, Mrs. Mrs. Ralph Herk Herk Herkum, H I R S C H K O R N Herkum, uh, eight five five Brer Place, Woodmere, New York. Uh, she sent this in coat, and it has a little, oh, I guess it's just a thing on there. She sent this note to me. See, yeah, please don't believe me. See that? See that? See that? See that? 
And we only got 505 8th Avenue, right? And the note says it's dated. Oh, okay, it's dated 121 uh, 87. Okay, so I remember this is this is uh, so in 80s, 87, 1987, uh, the beginning of January, there was a call to, um, there was a call to do a day of absence in New York. I uh, think of uh, who's, who's that guy? Sharpton guy, you know, he called out a book. Something happened in Brooklyn. Somebody, some cop killed, some, whatever happened like that. So they wanted a day of absence, right? And so I I took my group, my newly, the group I was just formed and, and trained them for like a year, trained them, the Crave Unity. Um, they had done, they had just got their program on, uh, I guess, yeah, around, yeah, around about this time, maybe even earlier, maybe even in, in December, late December. And, um, they just got their program. It came to it every other Friday night. Um, you know, Crave Unity Collective, right? And they, um, and so that was the first thing that they did. We did something live, you know, at night, whatever have you. But this thing, I went and I said, well, people don't know what Dave Absence is. They don't really know what it is, right? So because I was at the Negro Ensemble Company, which was, which was founded by Douglas Turner Ward and Bobby Hooks and um, Gerald S. Crone. Uh, Crone's the money guy. In fact, a little BAI history, just in case you need to know. Um, General Crone had an office down the hall um, because the Negro Ensemble Company was down at um, St. Mark's Place, like a seven, whatever, the Seventh Street, whatever it was, you know, um, down there on, on Second Avenue, right? And uh, and but uh, General Crone's office, he was the money person for you know one of the found money person for Negro Ensemble. Company. His office was up there on Broadway, with well, Broadway, well, those are the offices are with those kind of magic. But his office was down the hall from David Rothenberg. Come on now, you can't make things up like this. It comes all together. Anyway, so she wrote this note. Remember, this is oh, this is the first live audio drama I did on the radio. Okay, it's the very first one, right? After I got my group together and they, they were the, they, they were the, uh, how do you say, the, um, they were the core of, of, of my audio dramas for, for a long time, actually, until I left um, in 90. Yeah, I started in 87 until I left in 96, 96, so almost uh, whatever years, 10, 9 years. Okay, Anthony Sloan, KFWBA, 508. Uh, dear Anthony Sloan, I heard your production of of the Franklin, I don't know what they mean by Franklin, Douglas, D oh, uh, 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 Turner Ward play, it's be Douglas Turner Ward play, this morning from the start. All right, wait, we did it. I did it in the morning. It was late, late morning. I used the whole station. Just interesting. I had to work things off the news department's going like, what's going on here? <laughs> like that. Um, from the start. I thought it was truly top theater and translated perfectly for, to radio. A compliment, a compliment to your artistry. If you are familiar with the War of the Worlds that Orson Welles did many years uh well, ago, I guess maybe ago, got, um, many years. Oh, he got much adverse, adverse criticism, but it made his career. I, I'm white. Uh, I loved it. No black should be insulted. It was pure cynicism, and true. Congratulations on a great show. Sincerely, Ed, Adriana. Her name, Hawkinson. Oh, for Mrs. Ralph Hawkinson. Her name is Adri Adrian Hawkinson. She's the wife of um, what's, what's, that's her. So I just I just found this in this in this book. Amazing. So, do you see how everything? Let me let me continue. Right. Okay. So that was um, the first play. Oh, oh, I should say that I, I didn't do I didn't change a word from Douglas Douglas Turner Ward's or Doug Ward call him Doug Ward because you know, a Douglas Turner Ward's play, right? The only adjustment I did was uh, every word was the same. It's the only adjustment I did was because Crave Unity had this facility for different languages, right? Or different uh, act, different characters, right? I had made the mayor of the town, uh, the uh, I think it was Yusef, evoked the voice of Edward Koch at the time. Somebody else, somebody in authority, evoked the uh, voice of I think it was Michael Michael Mayburn, evoked the voice of Ronald Reagan, but but everything else was the same. Even the telephone. Everything was, was, was the same. But the only other thing I did was when Douglas Turner Ward wrote the play, he wrote this, uh, the one black character comes at the end, and the name is Rastus, right? 
and it, he he did it for like a stereotype of the of the how you say the the, the black character of the day. This the big stereotype of uh, uh, one of uh, what's that? You no know, lightning, but whatever you know the. Uh, you know the guy, the guy, the the the, the Will Rogers discovered. You know, not Lightning, the, the other guy. Um, oh man, I'm forgetting the cat's name, man. Uh, Lincoln, somebody. You know the one. Uh, ah, don't worry about it. The stereotype. You know, you know uh, what we sing, boss. You know that kind of thing, right? Okay, that's the only thing I did, and it was incredible. It was incredible piece. It was the first piece I ever. Did. First live audio drama I ever did, right? Okay, remember I'm training theater. I guess this this is oh that's interesting. This was uh, this was uh, eighty seven, seventy seven. So that's right. So I came to New York Company, Summer Company, in nineteen oh nineteen seventy seven. So ten years after being trained in theater, I do an audio drama. Wow, all these things are very interesting. Okay. So, but here's the big play I did. I'm gonna take time on this, though, because this is the play, you know? This whole, this is a script of, 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 of the play. It's, a, it's what we call a director's book. You see these kind of things when you go, for, go on movie sets or, or TV. Well, I've noticed when the TV sets, you can have your little notes in there like that, each page and all the rest of that stuff. I got it into sections. And like this section is, uh, what does it say? Uh, 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 Bernard, Harold, Youssef, Ingrid, Charlie, uh, Margo, uh, Chris, no, I, oh, this, this is the page with uh, Damon Cross. Well, these characters are on this page. Anyway, it, it breaks down the script. That's what you do when you do a director. I mean, a real director, not a theater director and stuff like that. So this is my book. But the thing about this piece, you have to understand, this was my, uh, before this, this is the outsider. Before this, I did uh, uh, The Long Dream. Now the long dream at the, it, 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 uh, by that time Caribbean she had uh, started with like eight people when I first started with um, a Douglas Turner Awards uh, Day of Absence, but by this time, by nineteen ninety one or whatever it is, um, I uh, the group was just four 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 guys right. There was uh, uh, Rodney Black, Daryl Ma uh, Dar uh, Dar McNeil, Daryl Martin McNeil. Uh, Michael Mayburn and Yusuf Lamont. That was the core thing. So I did this piece uh, from Richard Wright, because I read a lot of Richard Wright, read all of Richard Wright, uh, and, and called uh, The Long Dream. It was about basically coming of age of these four, four, uh, four, four teenagers, right? In fact, to this day, all those people teaching the Invisible Man or whatever you're all teaching in school, did, no, no, no. The, 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 the thing that young people are supposed to be reading, they should read uh, The Long Dream. Excellent. Excellent for for to relate to young people. Anyway, so so that was sort of like a, a I want to say graduation press, so, uh, for them because they had been we had been working since basically eighty seven to ninety to ninety one. So that's yeah, seven, eighty eight, eighty nine, ninety. So for four years that uh, we had been doing all kinds of audio dramas and stuff like that. Okay, uh, and usually on a black theme because remember the. I wasn't arts director yet, right? Um, and then I I did this piece here, the long this well the outsider, as a as a gift to myself. And it was it, it's like the um, how would you say it? the 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 play that they did, uh, the long dream was a graduation thing for creative unity. This is a graduation thing to myself into audio drama. Okay, there's a whole other thing I did with ritual audio drama. But this is my graduation thing, and the, th the script was this thick. The book was The Outsider. But what I did, like I said here, what I did is I made, I took two of, I took two of Richard Wright's works. One work was called uh, Lord Today. It was, it was the first book, he wrote the book before um, um, Invisible Man, right? But it wasn't published before *Visible Man*. Something like that it was his first uh, novel, but it was like a, a longer than a long, longer than a short story, but shorter than a novel. That's, that's the way I could put it, right? And so I, I adapted that, right? It took place in the fifties, right? I adapted that, and it was like book one. And then I had book two, was *The Outsider* proper, the the, the book *The Outsider* by by Richard Wright, which 
which basically outside if you think of it this way and in fact i saw i had a thing where is it oh here it is uh this this advertisement right here yeah oh yeah right here this one right here this advertising right here announcing the play right i i wrote in honor of henry f winslow senior right he said well who's henry f winslow senior what big deal i used to hang this is an older older uh, gentleman a literary kind of guy i used to visit him um over there right by lincoln center uh, he lived over there uh, uh, condominium or whatever whatever up there i used to visit him all the time just talk to him I, I used to talk to a lot of old people man i just had to sit with them just, just chat <laughs> i used to do this all the time and uh, but he was telling me all kinds of literary stories, whatever happened. But he he was also a critic, and when the outsider book came out, he was a, a literary critic. So when the outsider book came out, he called it. He said it was a bigger, bigger Thomas. That's a good one, right? So basically, what he was saying and what what, what it was is that when Richard Wright wrote the out when when the um, when uh, that that book came out with, with bigger Thomas, right? Um, he was sort of dismayed because he purposely wrote Bigger Thomas as a two-dimensional character. I mean, he purposely did that, but it was such a sensation. First, the, the, the National Book Club or whatever, whatever the, the literary, whatever that thing, that, it was the first black person, and, and, they, and they celebrated it. In fact, talk about old people. I lived in Princeton, or well, Lee Avenue, the same place where, you know, um, uh, Paul Rosen lived. I lived on Lee Avenue, right? And I was I rented a room from an old couple. Here was an old, like this old man and his and his wife. They used to be um, the butler and maid for these white people someplace, right? And they told me a bunch of stuff too. But one of the things they said is that when this book came out, when um, when Invisible, not Invisible Man, did I say Invisible Man? No, um, the one the bigger Thomas book. You know what I'm saying? You know which one I'm talking about. <laughs> I should look it up. Should I look it up? <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I was gonna bug me unless I unless I find did I say did I say that? Hold on a second. Don't go any place. Um let me look it up on this computer here. Oh, I gotta sign back in. My goodness. No, don't go any place. But what 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 happened was you got us Oh man. What is this password here? Okay, let me look this thing up. Hold on a second. Richard Wright, Richard Wright. Books, which write books. Uh, come on now. Nightboy, wait. Native Son. There you go. Native Son. Wait on. Oh, let's see what else they say here. Let's see what else. Yeah, Native Son was his first book. They also have uh, Uncle Tom's Children in here. The Man Who Lived Underground. I just got that book. I got that book. American Hunger. Very good. Oh, um, Told me in Black Voices. I've adapted that to a thing that I, I'm still working on all these years. But uh, Native Son. Sorry about that. Anyway, so Native Son uh, was was a, a it was a hit. And so what the what these this old couple, some of the at least the old guy was saying was that what happened was um, he the people that were but they made and people were so astonished by this book they would go the, the white people that was reading this book. They would go to their help and tell, is this true? Is this true? Like that. It was amazing. This guy was telling me. It was unbelievable. Oh, just some coconut water here. Mm. Uh, well, I'm taking time, man. This is my YouTube channel. This is this is for historical purposes. Historical purposes. For archival purposes only. Okay, so we have all that set down. Okay, so now, so, so we have this play that we did. Uh, this is part one of the play. Now, the way what I did was I did the first part of the play was done at the New York Post Cafe. That's the part we call Book One, um, um, or Law Today, Book One, um, and the Outside Dread. This is the Dread part, I think. Yeah, this is the Dread part. And then the next part is called the Outsider Pro Proper. Now, the Dread part takes place in the, um, see, the library broadcast from New York Post Cafe and the studios of WVAI. So we, we first we was at 
the New York Post Cafe. The whole cast was there. But we had the way we have it is the, the 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 character's name in the outside is called Cross. His name is Cross Damon, right? The what I did was that the the character. You know, when you hear yourself in your head, your voice is a lot deeper. It's a different thing than people hear you outside. So what I did rather to have a narration, right? I had the cross was Harold Lucas had a great great voice. He was an intern. He was an intern for Normal Radio. I had him play cross was like the out the, the voice that you would hear if somebody's talking. You would you would hear that voice. But then the inner voice, the voice that, that only Cross Damon was 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 hearing, I had um, Bernard White, the great Bernard White, uh, do the inner voice. So it had two different voice qualities. And basically that was also the narration. Um, uh, Damon, the inner voice was like, he would be talking to himself, you know, like, how you talk to yourself like that. So it was perfect. Anyway, so uh, so this first part takes place at... Uh, uh, Oh yeah, the dread part. It takes place. Um, well, we we recorded it. We we were broadcast live from the New Regan Post Cafe down there on Lower East Side, right? Uh, what was it? Uh, Third Street, right? So the whole cast was down there, right? The only one that wasn't down there was Yusuf. Well, let me just say, but here's the cast. So so Harold Lucius was down there. Bernard White, he was up at the station, so his voice would be disemboweled voice, right? Sorry, sorry, Fitzpatrick played Gladys. Uh, she also did herbs and elixirs to keep us up all night, or whatever. I'll, I'll explain this to you. So, but because, because it was a long night, anyway. So, uh, Shari played uh, Glass. The Bookman was played by Michael Mayburn. Uh, uh, the radio, all persons on the radio. Yusuf, okay, Yusuf was also up at the station. All persons on the radio. He played all the voices of the radio people. <laughs> that's, that's, it's wild, man. We do, when I did the production, it was, this was an incredible production. Okay. Uh, uh, Dot, uh, Dorothy Powers, uh, played uh, uh, Nadine Michelle Shaw, Nadine Shaw. She also, we wrote a um, a song, this was in this one here, the song was written, anyway, no, that was another play, okay. So, well, well, Nadine, Nadine, um, James, uh, James Spaulding and myself, we wrote, we created a song, wrote, wrote a song, James did the music, I did the words, the lyrics, blah, 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 and Nadine sang it. Okay, Jenny Bourne played uh, played Myrtle. She was she was a news she was from the news department. I always cast people from from the you know from all up from, had people from radio, people from theater, whatever happened. Uh, John McNeil, part of Creative Unity, he was the doctor. He played the uh, the the Mary telephone voice. Brenda Black. Oh, Bre Brenda was an intern for No More Radio. Her and her and Harold Lucas were the two interns for No More Radio. Uh, Lois uh, Griffiths, oh, this, Lois Griffiths from New York Post Cafe. She was a big to do at New York Post uh, Cafe. Charlie Morrow, right? Charlie Morrow, remember these people now? Charlie Morrow played Finch and also Doc. Charlie Morrow, oh man, great guy. Kim, okay. Uh, Nadine Michelle Shaw played a uh, nurse. The police, there's a policeman played by uh, Michael Mayburn. Somebody named Williams played by Rodney Black. It's, they were, they were just, just a dread play. The Waitress, played by Jenny Bourne, again from the news department. Oh, I played the clerk, Anthony Sloan. I threw myself in for like one little part, something like that. Uh, uh, Jenny was played by uh, Margot uh, Gribb. Oh, yeah, she was uh, she's something else. She tried to get some more money out of us. I'm like, uh, I'll get to that later. Oh, Teddy, Chris Brandt. Chris, Chris, that's right. Chris was in this. Mm, the best. Me and Chris are working on something right now. And Chris is the best poet, whatever have you. Anyway, um, uh, so no, today he, we do stuff together. He he did this thing with um, that was Smedley Butler that recorded. I uh, played Smedley Butler. It sounded like him. Whatever. It was really good. Uh, John McBeal played uh, Joe. Brenda Black played Ruth. People take more voice. I plugged to oh Bob Holman. Whoa! Then we have voices to be announced. I recruited from the thing. Bob Holman. You know who Bob Holman is? Okay. Think. I think the last thing he did. I don't know. The the, the, the Bowery poet. Poets Cafe, Parrot Bowery Poet Theater, whatever down there on the Bowery. But he used to, there was a bunch of us who all, we all got sort of banned from the New York Post Cafe from Miguel. It's a long story. But anyway, Bob Holman and his other, what's the cast name? The Puerto Rican a poet, right? Him, Bob Holman and a Puerto Rican poet back in the day, we're, I guess we're talking in the 80s, right? They're the ones, they created, you know, the, 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 the poetry, the poetry slams. Well, they these two guys created it down Louis Side. I, can, I remember that place that they used to. 
but they created it as a joke. It was a joke, and it took off. This is look. This is history. I know you. You could check it if you want, but find Bob Holman. What's that? Louis Louis Reyes Rivera. I think it was Louis Reyes Rivera and Bob Holman. Those two. They started as a joke. Is Louis still with us? I don't know. Anyway, so just so you know, okay. Also, studio and John Randolph. Okay, this is one smooth. Uh, Jay Smooth first came to the station. I trained him. Well, I trained him. I taught well sort of engineering and stuff like that for radio, right? He was like 17 years old when, when he came to the station. Anyway, so I trained him. But the first... <laughs> I do this all the time. But the first thing I did was this big... This is a huge play, right? And I just threw him as a studio engineer. You engineer, poof! <laughs> so <laughs> he had to engineer from the studio like that. John Fisk? Oh, John Fisk. John Fisk was the location engineer. In other words, he was engineering down at the um, for Dread, he was engineering down at the New York Post Cafe, the our location engineer. Now, John Fisk is a whole other story. John, there was like basically three uh, engineers, uh, people that would record poetry around around the time, usually at the St. Mark Theater. And, uh, and it was, uh, John Fisk was one, Dave, Dave what's, what's his name? And I was, no, it was three of us. We, people would trust us to record poetry. Uh, Broadcast live from New York Post Cafe and the Studio WB. So, so what what happened was at the first part, Dread, we we were live live audience there. That's why we recruited somebody from the audience to be a a, a voice, or whatever it is. How uh, well, we did it there at at at, at the New York Post Cafe. Then what we did was we took the news of the day, right? To do whatever the regular broadcast from the news department because it was a break. From 11 to 11.30, 11 to 12, something like that it was a, a break. But we, re, we we would rebroadcast the news. So in other words, the, the news would be broadcast, say, about 6 o'clock, 6 to 7, I guess, something like that. Or 7 to 8, whenever it was, right? And so what we did, as the play was going on, we because I remember every, I trained, when I trained community, I, trained, I trained everybody in how to engineer and cut, with this one, you mean splice and tape, you know, razor blades, splice tape. Razor. So what we did was while we would... We we um or we had this first part was going on, right? Because Yusuf wasn't in it right away. He was broadcast from thing. He took and re-recorded. You know, I guess we call it in South Africa we call them news presenters. You know, your anchors, right? We took the voices out for the rebroadcast news. We took their voices out, and Yusuf became the anchor for the news. So we so what happens? He affected it because took place play took place in 1950s. So he affected the voice of. Uh, of a 1950s kind of news person, right? So instead of you hearing, say, Jenny Bourne, whoever was presenting the news, you heard Yousef, right? But the news stories were the same. We just took them out and the news stories were the same. So the rebroadcast of the news was in fact part of the play, but the play was part of the... Di hey, look. When I get an idea, I work it all the way. I work it to the thing. So technically, this play started when it started, but we didn't even have... We, we had a... We, technically, even the news of the day was part of the play, okay? Now, while the news was being rebroadcast, re I took the cast, we took the cast from um, from uh, New York Post Cafe and, and we went up to BAI, you know, uh, 130, uh, 136 feet in 8th um, Avenue. It was 150, 150 8th Avenue. We have 505 8th Avenue. Woo! And then, then we did the play. We did the play from there. So here's the, so this is the dread cast. That was the dread cast I just read. See, Lord today, book one, uh, the, and, and oh, Lord today, and book one of the outsider. Somehow I, I blended I blended uh, Lord today and and, and and the outsider together. Uh, I, mean, I call that part dread. See, adapted to radio by Anthony Jackson. No, that would be, and as Yusef would say, and the J stands for justice. Okay, then, so here is, so here is the cast for the outsider. This is the, this is the thing that was done, that was the thing. Again, you had, you had uh, Bernard doing the inner voice of Cross Damien. You had uh, Harold Lucius doing Cross. Uh, uh, Yusef Lamont played Bob Hunter. Charlie Morrow played uh, Father Shelton. And Betsy Lemke played Arma. Okay, this is very interesting. This is very interesting. Now, Betsy, she was a, I have to say it this way because it's 
the ultimate liberal. She's the ultimate liberal. She was the, the, the Jewish voice, you know, a, a middle, 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 middle aged woman, right? And she had to say, the only real curse word in the whole play was that when he's on the train, there's a train accident, and that's how we go about to read the book, the outside. But a woman in the play, white woman in the play, calls him, calls him nigger. Somehow it says nigger, right? And Bessie Lemke, you know these liberals, she, she, I cast her to say to specifically for that one line, right? And she says, no, Anthony, I can't do that, blah, blah, blah. She was like, nah, nah. and I'll tell you what a great director I am. I said, but Bessie, you don't understand. I know you would never say that, but that makes you the perfect person to say it. Don't you understand? I'm just, oh, see, the director's nothing but a psychological, whatever. He runs, a director, what a director does, it has to do a whole lot of psychological things to get actors to do what they need to do to, to service the piece and da da da. Plus, plus the director is really just a, like the mayor of a city, you know, the logistics or whatever have you. Audio drama, really good at that. Anyway, so that was like a brilliant. It was a, she was successful. She was great. Anyway, uh, uh, voices one, two, three, two be announced. Uh, Eli Houston, Eli Hurston, uh, Chris Brandt played him. Jerry uh, Daryl McNeil. Mrs. Crawford, Jenny Bourne, uh, Clerk One, Michael Mayburn, Jack, played by Daryl McNeil. Remember, people play multiple voices because it's radio, you know. Uh, I play Kirk Two, Clerk, Clerk Two, slip myself in there. Uh, Ingrid uh, Edmondson plays Sarah Hunter. Uh, I, don't, I, remember, I don't remember Ingrid. Uh, uh, Charo Morrow played uh, Gil Blunt. Uh, Marco Grib played uh, Eva Blunt. He's like communist kind of, well, like, uh, Jack Hilton was played by Chris Brandt. Uh, Expatriate, Yusuf, Yusuf Lamont. Bessie Lemke played another one, Mara. She didn't have to say any bad words then, so she was all right with that. Maybe that's how I got her to, I don't know, I don't remember. Langley Hurton played by the great Max Schmid. He's still on BF. Max Schmid, I love Max. He does radio talk. Um, he plays, the, oh, he does old time radio like that. He even did a little, go oh, there. We never really got together to get his troop and my troops together. Uh, uh, Menti, John Randolph, so again, Jay Smooth was in the play too, he was engineer in, in the play. Lieutenant Farrell, played by Michael Mayburn. Cop, Yusuf Lamont. Dr. Stockton, Daryl McNeil. Clerk Three, Charlie Morrow. You see how we how we doubled up and tripled up and quadrupled up, right? Nadine Michelle Shaw played the uh, humming, humming, the humming maid. Margaret played Nancy. Daryl McNeil's Cop Two. Cop Three, John Randolph. Uh, Captain Ross. Oh, Vince Williams. Oh, Vince. Vince was a soap opera actor. Well, you know him as a soap opera actor. He was a musician. We were, uh, he was my roommate at the time. Well, I, 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 uh, Central Park West on like 104th Street, something like that. We had a little apartment. Uh, uh, Vince passed. Oh, peace and blessings. Lord's eternal soul. He was a great saxophone player. We'll get to that in a second. Well, like, uh, he was a soap opera actor. He was on The Guy in Light or something like that. One of those things like that. And he was, he died very, very young. Very, very young. He just married. He just died young. Too young, anyway. So he was my roommate at the time, so I, I got him in the play. You know, wow, why not? Bad. Hey, uh, Charlie Morrow played Mr. Bloomin. Oh, Mr. Blue, that that Bloomin and the and the cross there and the cross uh, scene is amazing. That that that's the heart of the piece. That's why I did it, and I'll take you back to that in a second too. Uh, Hornsby is played by Yusef Lamont. Finch was played by Charlie Morrow. Charlie Morrow, man. Charlie. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Cyrus Pax played uh, Glass on Audio Tape, something like that. Oh, Y.W. Cop. That's a young white cop. Played by Jake Glass. My man, Jake. Boop, boop, boop. So what, what do you mean, Jake? Jake, see, I get everybody into it. Now, Jake, remember I told you that John Randolph was the board engineer at um, uh, at uh, at BAI. And you said for the month. Oh, you said for the month. And um, what was that? Where's my engineer then? And, uh, oh, yeah. So he's the board engineer. He's the board operator, engineer at the thing, right? Yusuf was assistant was my assistant to the director, right? But Jake Glant was a technical director for the entire thing. But Jake is also did I mention him here too? Uh, where's where's it? Yeah, Jake Glant's technical director and John Ram's studio engineer because John Fisk was the location engineer. So location engineer at the New York, New York Cafe was John Fisk. The 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 engineer at the um, at the station was John Randolph. Okay, but I was engineering too. But I would not you know, I would just. I mean, yeah, I knew it threw him in there, but you know, come on, I wasn't do that to somebody. It's something this huge, right? Like that. Uh, 
uh, uh, live broadcast. Okay, here it is. There's this one scene with Bloomin' and this other thing. There, this, uh, this, 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 this really talking this communist thing that they did. Um, um, uh, uh, what's this? The guy, the the guy Bloomin, Mr. Bloomin, and uh, Cross Damon. They're having this back and forth like that. So what I did was. I in they were in the in the thing but in the hallway I had I had um James Spaulding, who's the music director for the play piece, uh and he played saxophone and flute, right? And I had Vince, Vince Williams played saxophone instrument in in in, in, in an incidental instrument, right? But what it is when these two people would talk, there was music all throughout with James they, they did music throughout this thing with the station. But what I did when these two characters were in, I had these guys in the hallway, they were Mike Sully, and they would basically have a, a saxophone battle in the hallway. And when I was trying to explain, when I first got the people together to do this, Jake, Jake the engineer, who's the engineer, you know, so I'm explaining to to, to, to James and Vince what, what has to happen. You know, they're, they're fucking intense. Yeah, yeah, they get in the course. They're, they're jazz musicians, you know. Come on. Musicians I like to work with are jazz musicians. Well, I don't work with people no more, but don't worry about that part. So. so so Jake is standing there. I'm going back and forth. Damn, hey, we can do this. We're gonna mic the hallway like this. The things are gonna be happening there. Da, 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 and go through the whole thing. And then Jake, you have to know Jake, in the most deadpan thing, he looks at me. He says, "What gave you that bright idea?" Then I knew. I think this is the first time Jake worked with me. Yeah, because he wasn't doing. Yeah, he wasn't there for. Uh, no, he wasn't the, the the. He wasn't there for. The long dream. Yeah, this is the first time we worked with, you know. But then he became an engineer for really huge things that we came because Jake understood me, you know, and he could do stuff. You know, he he built the Sony studio. He built Sony studio. He works for Sirius Satellite Radio right now. That's a long, long story. He's big time tech like that. So so that's the story. So we did this thing. This play was so powerful. And we were going all night long. We had what did I have? What's that thing that says uh oh real story? Oh, here it is. No, that's not it. There's an advertisement that we... Oh, here it is. Here it is. Uh, I'll read that. I, I've made an announcement. Uh, I should go on today. Okay, here, here it is. Here's the, here's the advertisement that, that we had that we sent around. For the outside, it looked like this. I still have this laminated someplace. Looked like this. So you have, uh, it explains that we have uh, part one, dread, part two, the outsider. Uh, the thing is, can a man truly disappear within himself, yet affect the lives and histories of his friends and family? That's what's true. And then part two, it says, follow the tortured soul of an African-American through the sociological and psychological landscape of America circa, circa 1950, 1950 when I was born. Um, so basically, this, uh, that's what it says right there. But here is the cast. They have the cast written there. Now at the bottom, you see here, well, you don't see it here. Remember I, I, I what the cast was, right? Now musicians, James Spaulding, uh, Vince Williams, right? Original song by Nadine Shaw, Anthony Sloan, and James Spaulding. Uh, Sunshine Spirits is the song that we did, right? Um, no, that's what Sunshine Spirits said me and James did. And uh, what's the name we did? Not, that's another song. Uh, okay, now broadcast live series of WBI. Uh, uh, that production made possible by grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. I have to say this. I won two years in a row. One for post-production for The Long Dream. Right? That's a hard can't explain it right now. But then, so I won the, the, the highest amount of money you could get for... Uh, a single person for a national endowment for the arts, and, and, and whatever the the, the big, the, the, well, the, what they just finished saying, the national, uh, yeah, national endowment for the arts, and and the NEA, whatever NEA. But then I applied next year, and I got again, I got the highest, I think ten thousand dollars was the highest for an individual grant, right? So I took that money to produce this. To pay, you know, pay the, pay the people, da 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 da, da do all of the stuff that had to be done. Um, so that's what publicity, Daryl McNeil, he's in charge of publicity, photography, Michael Mayburn, graphics, uh, Rodney Black, Yusuf, I know what these graphics is by uh, 
Yusef and and, uh, and and Rodney. So those are those are my core group. Those are, that's creative unity. Uh, special assistance, Andrew T. Oh, one's like Andy wants and Mel. Oh, Andy wants like what? What? He's Jake's. Him and Jacob together. But Andy wants like he's still around. I got to see Andy. I want to talk to him. Herbology, elixirs, and performance tonics by Sari Fitzpatrick. See, because we had to be up for so long. Well, I had to be up for so long. But you know, so when we had the when we we had the cast up at at the at the station. You know, Sari had tonics to keep everybody up, right? Okay. So then, um, uh, recorders. Oh, oh, Ed Haber, uh, was re recorded, and uh, Steve Marshall, one of my one of my radio children, recorded. Uh, assistant director Yusuf Lamont Foley, uh, Joseph Masseri Jr. You know Joseph Masseri, Fritz too. We use Fritz. It's a binaural microphone. We use that in the studio. Uh, location engineer John Fisk, studio engineer uh, John Renner, Yusuf Lamont, Darley. Technical director Jake Lance. Produced, adapted, and directed by Anthony Sloan for No More Radio. Da da. So this is what this is what this is. This is history. This is the script. I worked on this sucker. You have no idea how much work this was, right? In fact, there's a picture of me with the script. I have, I, I, I did everything, even even copy the script. I have, I have all this. Have, did everybody got a script, whatever it is. And there's a picture of me someplace. It exists someplace. So let me just stand there amongst the script that I had finished. I worked on this thing day and night, you know, day and night. I was, I was zoned. I mean, I was, I was in it. I was in it to win it, right? So there you go. Memories, this book here, and um, like th this is what you have to do as a director and stuff like that. You have this thing. This is, I'm looking for something in here. This is what also, this is what happens when you have friends that are, I don't want to say pack rats, but friends that are that will keep your stuff for you as I travel around because you know, I'm the mystic wind, I don't stay in one place too long. I'm looking for something. Here. See the pool on the ground. Here's a photo. Oh, here it is. It's a photo. This is what I looked like back at this time. I was, I was, I was a pretty handsome young man. See that? See that photo right there? See, that's the way I looked at the time. Got my locks and everything. You know, I just started my locks. I think they started my locks in '89. Yeah. So this is, he is about yeah, like that. And uh, uh, Randy. Uh, Randy Miller did my locks. Well, I had done. I had. I had started them, and she looked at. She said, "I could do better." She had come from a long line of hair, uh, hair technicians, right? And so that's why my locks look really good. I uh, like that. I guess I'm wearing some sort of African shirt, or some sort of shirt like that. I'm reading something. What am I reading? I'm reading something here. Who's somebody? No. And I have the thing says radio television, film, radio television, media arts. Some sort of book I'm reading. What's this book? Now I want to know what this book is. Bruce Batty? I don't know. This is taking apart. I probably, I don't know who took this picture. I don't know. Okay. So that's it. This is the, that's the story of The Outsider. A huge play. He, he, here's, the, here's the kind of guy I am. This is the kind of play that if I went to the Guinness Book of World Records, I could have applied it and won some sort of thing. But here's the thing. Here's the funny thing about me. I never wanted fame. I want. I'm always under the radar. I mean, I've been. I'm an as. I'm an asterisk or as, an asterisk is asterisk in so many things. I mean, things from like the first. Uh, what was the National Writers Union? I was there at the beginning. Uh, you. I can't even tell you how many things I was right there at the beginning. Of, like I'm like a witness traveler. Like never wanting any fame, which very low. You know. All the stuff, the, all the stuff at the, at, uh, at, uh, 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 oh, but things like, oh man, like, like all the stuff that Samori and Bernard, uh, Samori, Samori Marksman and, and Lombe Breath did, did, did taping those forums in the 80s, you know, all kinds of stuff, man. I, I'm like, whoa, you know, in Af South Africa, the Pan African Space Station, you don't know nothing about it. It was amazing. All these initiatives, amazing initiatives I've been involved in, but I've seen like that. Things in radio, it's just like, I've lived a very good life. But the thing is, here's the funny thing. People do the Sankofa thing. I don't really, this time I'm looking back, but I don't really look back. That's the whole thing. I keep on, I'm, <laughs> I don't care. I'm, I'm the type of person, I dig deep into myself rather than, you know, 
uh, I kind of want to act like, like when we did, okay, let me put this way. We did a, I did a play called Oh Yeah, right? Um, it was at the National Black Theater with David Wright. Um, and and in, 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 in the piece, about, in the piece of the Yoruba play, but Oh Yeah, you know, thing, right? Now, nobody knew who I was. David knew my work. David knew who I was. But uh, the great Tunde Samuels was the producer. It's Barbara and Tears Theater, right? Um, um, there was your whatever it is. And nobody knew that I directed theater. They just didn't know, right? And so, so Tunde, bless his heart, and peace and bless on his eternal soul. He, he, he listened to that. I think David must have called us for favors. David said, no, he's directing like that. So, so Tunde was kind of very perceptive. He watched him and says, oh, okay, let's see what's going on, right? Then when he seen what's going on, he said, whoa. Well, he didn't say, well, I'm saying he said, whoa. This is what I just way I operate. If, if everybody does their job, I don't put no bill, bill, check for them. If everybody does their job, this thing's going to be done, whether it comes, whether, whatever's going to be done. So Tunde realized that David wrote the, wrote the piece, that the piece I, you know, I helped. I'm directing. He said, I got a very confident, I got a good writer. I can now be producer. So he went and really produced. But what he did was best of all because Barbara Antier was in charge of the thing. Let me put it this way. Barbara Antier is a child of, was peace and blessing on her eternal soul, was a child of, Shug of, of Shango. I'm a child of Ogun. Go figure. I would just say. So what Timothy did, one of the things he did so brilliant, he kept Barbara away from the production and away from me. Because <laughs> I have to say this. As an audio dramatist, when, when I do audio plays, right, I'm great. I mean, I just like I like having a good time. I just have a good time. That's just, that's just, that's just, that's just legend. Uh, and when I'm doing poetry, whatever it is, I have poetry groups. So I'm, I'm fine, right? But when I do a theater proper and I have to direct and there's, there's money involved, whatever have you, I'm a classic theater director. I'm, I wouldn't want to be in my place. I'm a tyrant. I'm talking about tyrant. I'm talking about, you know, those classic theater directors that don't, I fire people. Some of it, I fire people. <laughs> However, my production, that, that production of Oya it was amazing, right? It was the first time Barbara and Tia got calls at home to try to get tickets to get into the theater. It was sold out every night. Every night. Man, to have, anyway, it was, it was a classic. Too. Again, it was, a, it was a first time thing, you know. But my story is that I do stuff. It's almost like I do it. It comes to a point where I said, okay, you've done this. You're through with that. We got something else for you to do. And I go and do something else. Innovative. You know what I mean? I can't even tell you all the stuff that I did you know, with audio, real audio, with audio drum when I was traveling around. This was then in the studio. But when I do a lot of like, uh, stuff I did up in, 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 uh, in Montreal and I mean, just all the, all the places, stuff I did at, in, in, in Mexico in uh, South Africa, of course, like, man, couldn't, you can't beat it. I'm the man, I'm the myth, I'm the legend. No, 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 no. I can be, well, this is my YouTube channel. I'm just saying this because, okay, let me just say this. This is going to be on YouTube channel. It's, when I do my YouTube channel, I don't ask for subscribers, nothing like that. You know what I mean? My, I, it's not monetized. I, I don't look for anything like that. I just post up because... What really happened, I gotta go through the whole thing now. What really happened was for years, because uh, I should say this, basically when I came to BAI, especially, I'm an archivist. You know what I mean? I, I, I record, I'm a recorder, I'm an archivist. You know, loads of ground, support, you know, I got your back kind of thing. I love you. Um, but I would tell people, you know, even back then, say, record your elders. You know, you gotta, people gotta record. Someday, this is like in the, in the, in the early 80s, and someday there's gonna be a thing where everything your whole life can be put on one little chip. Think about that. Well, and uh, so I want people to record. No, but here's the other thing. People do not listen to me, right? I'd be saying stuff like years later, people say, Anthony, you were so right. Oh, man. Blah, 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 blah. So at some particular point, I'll tell you what the point was. 2014, I realized, you know, I'm an elder. <laughs> I go like, I'm an elder. Maybe I should just... Use use YouTube because I just like I said it's for all kinds of purposes. I just use it as a a way to like uh, my memoirs on YouTube. You know what I mean? Something like that, like that. And now it's morphed to something else because now 
uh, I figured that because of a whole bunch of other circumstances. People say in my lineage, like, you know, my, my children who I, or grandchildren or great grandchildren might have, they might say, look me up. And now through YouTube, they can see my holes. They can, they can, know, they can know all about me. Anybody can know all about me because I don't hide anything. I, you know, <laughs> and now the, the world's catching up. They, everybody's going to be monitored, whatever have you. I ain't got nothing to have. Yeah, well, you said, well, you got to, they'll, they'll do this, they'll do this. Don't care. It's out there already. It's done. And I, I my archives are in several different places. Anyway, I took a long time to explain the outside, the the, the tone, the 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 and by way of also, I have rest, several very plateaued important things like it's like I go up and then say yeah I'm through with that then I just move around you know what I mean. I like me, and the way you can be me, no you can't be me. Sorry, but what happens really is that I have this thing I call the third infinity. See, I exist in the third infinity, right? Which means I go deep, so deep into myself that I'm protected. I just know myself so much that people can't knock me off course. You can't deter me from, and now I'm, I'm old. You know, people definitely can't. You know how old people are? Yeah. Yeah, you must be right. Go, you don't argue with people. You just go, you don't go, you know, you say so. Somebody says, yeah, but blah, 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 blah. You don't argue with them. You know what I mean? You leave it alone. You find another way to do it. So anyway, that's it. Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. This has been me, T, from the Patterson's Taking the Train to Tibet, letting you know what I only suspect about a bunch of things.